Gavis and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Florin Diaku from the University of Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, he will speak about Newton's equations in spaces of constant cur curvature. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandra, for having me here. I uh, really like to be in Rome. I've never been to this university before, but uh, uh, now I know this university as well, so uh, I'm very glad to be here. Um, so, my goal today is to present some results which here you see. Uh, they've been published also something I have not yet published, and in fact is some a very recent work I will show you at the end, uh, and of which I'm quite excited. Uh, but what I'm going to talk mainly today is uh, how to obtain the equations in, uh, of, so the a generalization of Newton's equations to spaces of constant curvature, uh, why that generalization is uh, the one it should be and not another one, and also some finding some solutions, uh, some simple types of solutions uh, in these spaces, and also why research of this type has some any significance. Okay, so um, a bit of the history of the problem. Now, when I started working on this a few years ago, I didn't know what other people had worked in this direction. I found out only a few months later, and I was glad that I was on the same track that actually was started by Boya and Lobachevsky. Uh, and it was a time, it was, uh, you know, the first part of the first decades of the 19th century, when people already started thinking they were among the first, and Gauss was also one of them, started thinking that there might be a connection, that there must be a strong connection between, the, between space, between the physical space and geometry. So uh, then uh, both Boya and Lomachevsky independently, independently they, they came up with, uh, so discovered uh, hyperbolic geometry, in the same way they thought Okay, if we have, if our space, we don't know how our space is, is it Euclidean or is not Euclidean? No? Maybe it's, it's elliptical, spherical. It's a spherical, like you know, it's a, we live in a sphere, in a three dimensional sphere. Or maybe in a three dimensional hyperbolic space. We just don't know. We don't even know the answer to this question today, to this natural physical question. Physicists think that we live in a flat space, but we, they have no proof. So, uh, oh, of course, even if it's not flat, for sure it's very close to flat. So the curvature, if it exists, is very small. So, but still, we don't know the answer. So Boyan Lobachevsky thought about this problem of a two-body problem first. And what was their idea? Their idea was the following. Um, let's, what, what potential should I take? Should, should we take for, for such a problem? Uh, how can we generalize the potential? And they thought of Gauss' law, uh, the Gauss' law for gravitation, and in Gauss' law you can see very clearly that, um, well, sure, it's equivalent to the Newtonian, but there you can see very clearly how, how Gauss thought. He said, okay, gravitation should be uh, inversely proportional to the area of a sphere. Right? Why? Because you, know, you lose force. The force that when, when the sphere grows, the area grows, you know, then you lose uh, forces is smaller, becomes smaller. So the larger the area, the, the smaller the, the, for the force itself, the value of the force. So then they thought, okay, now we know, sure, we know what the area of the sphere is, it's proportional to r squared, the radius, so then the, uh, uh, the force should be proportional to one of them. Okay, now they said we're in hyperbolic space, because they thought about hyperbolic space, since they came up with hyperbolic geometry. 
Well, the area of a sphere in hyperbolic space is not proportional to R squared, but is proportional to sine hyperbolic of R squared. Of, so sine hyperbolic squared of R. So then they said, they said, okay, then the potential, then the potential must be um, cotangent hyperbolic of R. I guess the you take the, the derivative of the potential to get the gradient of the potential to get the, the force. You know? So the, the derivative of, of cotangent hyperbolic is involves one over sine uh, hyper, sin hyperbolic squared. And similarly for the sphere, then you do the same thing. So you you would need a potential that is cotangent of the distance for the sphere, and cotangent hyperbolic of the distance. So that's the natural generalization if you look at gaps. And thinking this way, that there were people who worked on this problem, on the two-body problem, only on the two-body problem. Famous names like you know Le Jean de Richelet, uh, Serre. Serre is not the one with Serre Frenet for, uh, frame, but the, the uh, another say they were cousins. I think they lived at about the same time. This was a uh, worked in mechanics, not in geometry. And Schering, who was a colleague of Gauss and younger than Gauss, actually was his uh, uh, edited his, part of his uh, the, the papers. He left, and ex actually Schering was the first to write the potential explicitly, as I told you. Boyan uh, Kobachevsky just had the idea. They said, that's how we should take the potential. But they know, never wrote down, whoops, never wrote down uh, it explicitly. Uh, killing Liebman, Liebman was a famous mathematician in, in uh, not only in geometry, and was actually a professor in Heidelberg and was also the um, rector of the university, so the president of the university, before the Nazis came to power. He was Jewish, so then they, they sacked him after that. He also died before the war started. Uh, Schrodinger worked on a quantum version of the problem. Uh, so when he was in that way. Who? Schrodinger. 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 Schrodinger, yes. So Schrodinger worked, so he adapted the problem for, for the values of for quantum mechanics, so for the... Yeah, but when he was in, in Ireland, because I, I, I was uh, in the same institution. Yes, when he was in the advanced studies system, the yeah. institute in Ireland, yeah, that's, that's when he worked on this problem. Okay. Yeah. And uh, also uh, um, Infeld and, and Shield. Infeld was it's a Polish, he has a paper with Einstein, a book with Einstein, actually. He was a postdoc of Einstein in Princeton, and then was a professor at the University of Toronto. And Shield was one of his students. Um, then the Russian School of Celestial Mechanics worked in the 90s on the two-body problem. And I learned about it in two, from a paper of 2005, I think I read it in 2008, the first time by these three Spanish mathematicians, Jose Carignena, Manuel Raniada, and Mariano. Um, but, as I said, they, everybody worked here either on the Kepler problems or on the two-body problem. Why am I saying either or? Because they are two distinct problems in curved space. So in flat space, Kepler problem is the same as the two-body problem. Yeah? No difference between them. But the Kepler problem here is one problem, the two-body problem is another problem. And the Kepler problem is integrable, the two-body problem is not integrable anymore. So the two-body problem becomes a serious problem, and nobody went beyond it until I started working on it. Then, well, why nobody went beyond it, I don't know. Maybe they just couldn't write the equations of motion. Because they tried to use intrinsic coordinates, so differential geometry. And things become quite complicated if you do that. Not knowing that, I you know I didn't try to do it in, in uh, uh, with, with differential geometry, but I tried to use directly extrinsic coordinates, and also had the idea of the right model for hyperbolic geometry. And now I'm going to show you what that model is. So 
In other words, I took the sphere as a sphere. We know what the sphere looks like. We can, I can talk directly in three dimensions. So the three-dimensional sphere would be you know, w squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared is uh, r squared, if r is the radius, and kappa is 1 over r squared, so kappa is the curvature. And then the model is that of the hyperbolic, so-called hyperbolic sphere for kappa negative, namely w squared plus x squared plus y squared minus z squared is a negative, a negative number. Uh, geometrically, this is, if you look at if you think just in two dimensions, this would be the upper sheet of a hyperboloid of two sheets. Yeah. Of course, this would be just the three-dimensional manifold, for the corresponding three-dimensional manifold. And uh, this, however, as I will show you later, is not in the in R4, but is in the Minkowski space, and I will explain. So, of course, for, if I take kappa, equal 1, uh, then uh, the manifold is just a unit sphere, three-dimensional sphere, and for minus 1 is the unit hyperbolic, three-dimensional hyperbolic sphere. So, now we're taking n bodies. n bodies in R4 for kappa positive and in the Minkowski space. What do I mean by the Minkowski space? I mean R4 with a different inner product. So instead, instead of taking the inner product plus, 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 no, because you would have, let's see now, 4 plus, 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 C minus 1, plus 1, we take plus, 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 minus. And with this, the upper sheet of the hyperbola of two sheets becomes a space of constant curvature. If, you, if we're in R4, it's not, it's not constant curvature, but then it's negative constant curvature. So, uh, in this way, we can work with them together at the same time. As potential, of course, I'm going to take the cotangent potential, cotangent for, of the distance for kappa positive and for positive curvature and cotangent hyperbolic for, for negative curvature. So I don't know this line. It means that if it is a sphere, it's embedded in R4, and if it is an hyperboloid, it's embedded in this line. In the Minkowski space, yeah. But Minkowski space would only spatial coordinates. Yeah. So the four dimension is, I don't have time, time coordinate. But, so if you want then, the notation R31 means that three, I have three positive signs for the product and the negative. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the Minkowski space, then the interpretation of coordinates. Of course, yeah, just the Minkowski space, exactly. So now, if you write the potential, the cotangent potential, and if you do the computations, you see that the, co the, the potential looks like this. That's, so if you take cotangent of the uh, distance on the sphere, or the distance, the hyperbolic distance on the uh, uh, hyperbolic sphere, this is what the potential looks like. Yes. The both is uh, vectors are three dimensional objects. So the vectors are four dimensional, but you have a constraint. You have the constraint that they are on the sphere or on the hyperbolic sphere. But they are four dimensional. They are, yeah, so I'm in a four dimensional space centered at the center of the sphere. Yeah, it's, it's the origin of the coordinate system is, is in R4 or in the Minkowski space. And they Satisfy the constraint that the bodies are that uh, uh, so it's in like three dimensions, yeah. But it's it's the vectors are four dimensions. And you can still have collisions, huh? singularities in the four yes, dimensions. yes, of course, yeah. So the singularities occur. You see these quantities, these quantities here. When I'm on the sphere, they are one. This quantity is one. And if I'm outside the sphere, they are not. But if I'm on the sphere or on the hyperbolic sphere, these quantities are one. So then I have a collision when this quantity is itself one. The squared quantity is one. That's, I can have no collision, but on the sphere there is another possibility. That quantity vanishes, since you asked me about singularity, that quantity vanishes also when, the two, when two points are antipodal. So if they're like North Pole and South Pole, diametrically opposed, then again I have a singularity. And is there any uh, generalization of the regularization theory? In the current space? Yes, 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 everything can be done here. Yeah. 
to regularize. I'm not going to take, talk today about singularities, that's not my plan, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I have papers on, on the singularities, uh, which, you know, uh, um, you can do the regularization, and you can find very interesting types of, of solu solutions that end up in singularities. Mm -hmm. when the singularities, uh, maybe in this field there is a problem, but in, uh, normally the behavior at the singularity should be the same, because the space doesn't really, should not feel very much the fact that it's curved or not curved, and then it's more well, relative to the collision singularity, yes. yeah. behavior is very similar. It should be yeah. exactly the it's same. exactly the same. But on the sphere, not on the hyperbolic yeah. sphere, on the sphere you have extra sphere. Yes, that's, a, okay, this is something that, that's the only thing that, yeah, but sure, you're right. It behaves exactly the same way. But the new singularities give rise to very interesting new types of solutions, which you don't find in flat space. Can you also have non collision singularities? Well, the, the antipodal are non-collision singularities in themselves, but if you can have non-collisions in the sense of uh, Shah's paper, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe in hyperbolic space you can. Um, I doubt that you can do that on the sphere because the sphere is a compact surface, right, itself. So you cannot go to infinity to get that kind of, of uh, singularity. Maybe you can do it in hyperbolic space, but I don't know. To get what kind of velocity? Infinite velocity. Infinite velocity? No, no. You cannot. Well, well um, you, you can. can like, and then the collision to get yeah. infinite velocity. Yeah. No, but also it could be that uh, you extract uh, energy from two bodies that are closer and closer together, and the third body carries away. It is like goes closer. away, but has no infinity to go away. Yeah, but well, yeah. Tangent space, yes. In, in tangent that, space? In, yeah, sure, sure. In, 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 in configuration space, yeah. 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 In, in, only in, in phase space. Yeah. Okay, but as I said, I don't know the answer to, to this question. Now, interesting is this this is a homogeneous function of degree zero. So we have actually a bifurcation. Now, because for the, the Newtonian potential in flat space and gradient space, a homogeneous function of degree minus one. This one is a homogeneous function of degree zero. Um, now, why, I didn't answer yet the question, why is that potential, uh, why is this the potential to take? Sure, I gave you some hint. Boyan Lovachevsky thought this is a natural generalization looking uh, through the eyes of uh, uh, Gauss' law. But there are other reasons. And Liebman was the one who found the answer. And maybe he had two answers. Both are of mathematical nature, not physical nature. The first one is that you think, okay, the behavior, the potential should behave similarly to that of the Kepler problem. So we have the same properties as the, as the potential of the Kepler problem. And it has. Namely, the Kepler problem, the potential of the Kepler problem is a harmonic function. So a solution of Laplace equation in three space, not in two, not in two dimensions, in three dimensions. And this fact is also true for this potential. Of course, you don't take the Laplace equation, you take the Laplace Beltran equation since you're in, in curved space, but again, it's a solution of the Laplace Beltran equation. And the, the other property that Liebman discovered is that the property of Bertrand. Bertrand showed that the Kepler for the Kepler problem um, always uh, the Kepler problem itself, so the two-body problem in flat space, right? Uh, all bounded orbits are closed. No? So we have ellipses. This is also true in um, in uh, for, for all the So that's what we mean. So these are the mathematical reasons why they tell you this is the potential to go with and not another one. Because we have infinitely many ways of generalizing the Newtonian potential such that in the limit you get still the Newtonian potential. Okay, so encompass it. Okay, so now how can we obtain the equations of motion? This is the set. Well, you have to use a variation method. For instance, constrained Lagrangian dynamics. Now and then, 
you obtain, if you use that, that's what the equations of motion, after you do the computations, you see that that's what the equations of motion look like. So you have a gradient of the potential plus some extra term, and that extra term that involves the velocities is there because of the curvature. So you have to, in order to keep the bodies on the, the manifold, uh, you need the extra term. They, they come from the Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange multipliers uh, show you this after the computations. Again, these quantities are one on the manifold. This is one, this is one, and this is one, and this is one. So in fact, once you are on the manifold, sure, when you have these equations, you have to work initially in R4. Otherwise, you cannot obtain the equations. But once you obtain them, you can take things equal to one there, and the equations are much simpler. Now, what is the advantage, what is the disadvantage of these equations? The advantage, they're pretty, not much more complicated than the, with the standard equations. Disadvantage, you don't see, I mean, if you take kappa equals zero, you don't see that I mean, something undetermined. In the limit, you can show that in the limit you obtain, when kappa goes to zero, you obtain the Newtonian equations. But you don't see them when you take kappa equals zero. So this is the disadvantage of these equations. And in the end, towards the end of the talk, I will show you that we can remove this disadvantage. So at the end of the talk, I will show you some equations where in which when you take kappa equals zero, you obtain exactly the Newtonian equations. Okay. So now we have equations. What to do with them? Well, of course, you have to try to find some solutions. But before that, let's notice that we can do some rescaling such that we don't have infinitely many problems, so for, for each kappa you have a different problem, but you have, in fact, two essential problems. One for kappa positive and one for kappa negative. Now, because qualitatively speaking, they will behave the same way. Quantitatively, not, but qualitatively, when you look for qualitative results, it doesn't matter whether you work with kappa equal 1 or with kappa equal 7.5. No, it doesn't matter. That's what I'm showing here. So in other words, in other words, I have two essential problems. For kappa positive in S3, you see the equations there, and for kappa negative in H3, and you see the equations here. You see they're very similar, just some signs change, and of course the dot product is not the same in the two samples. No, it's just, a, here is the Lorentz product of the plus, 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 minus, and there is the standard. And here are the constraints, which you asked me about. Uh, so here are the constraints for how to keep the bodies on this here. And here are the constraints for the velocity, which mean what? You have, so the velocity is always perpendicular to the sphere. Actually, those constraints you don't have to put there only the initial condition that you satisfy. Once the initial condition is satisfied, then they are satisfied with the matter. So the bodies will stay on the sphere. The equations keep the bodies on the sphere as, the, as we go. So you have to put there for, just for the initial conditions, here and here. Okay. So now I said what to look for. Well, before we look for, let's notice that it's a Hamiltonian system. Of course, I said we can put it in that larger framework. And here it is. And so we have an integral of energy, right? This is the integral of energy. I mean, the Hamiltonian then we have as expected. The problem is that we lose the integrals of the center of mass and the integrals of the linear moment. They are not valid anymore. And you say, well, that's surprising. It's not. It's not surprising because Einstein himself, Levi Civita before him, and Vladimir Falk after them, um, he, uh, they obtained also um, discretized Einstein's equations to obtain an n-body problem uh, in, for every curvature. So not, not just for constant curvature as we have here. Right? 
So, uh, of course, if you do this problem, you, depending how you do the approximation, you'll take different equations. But what matters is that in all those cases, the integrals of the center of mass and linear momentum disappear. So they are specific just to the Euclidean space. Once we get out of the Euclidean space, we don't have anything. So does this mean that the problem is not divided in the equation, the equation are not yeah. divided by translation? Yes, exactly. That's what it means. So, uh, but we do have, but we do have um, integrals of angular moment. And for this, we have to define, so in R4, I have to define a, a wedge product. Yeah, this is how we define the wedge product, because we don't have a cross product in R4. Cross product is specific to R3, so we define the, the wedge product, and we have to take a, a Grassmann algebra over R4, and then we get that the angular momentum of the angular total angular momentum measures rotation, how the bodies rotate relative to something. Now in R3 we have an axis, right? So we have rotation around an axis. But in R4, uh, we have to think of rotations relative to planes, no? because if you, you have uh, infinitely many given a plane, you can take with infinitely many perpendiculars and infinitely many directions. Right? While, while here, so then you have to think somehow, we obtain these six integrals. So you have to think somehow that each constant um, that shows up is somehow related to rotation relative to a plane, not relative to a, an axis. So we have six integrals. In R3, we have three integrals. So here we have six. Okay. Now, I said we should look for some solutions. <coughs> yes. This is total angular momentum. Total angular momentum, of course, yeah. They are conserved. Six quantities that are conserved. Yeah. Now, what are the simplest solutions you can look for? Relative well, equilibrium. Yeah. So, the body is such that the uh, uh, motion, uh, Mutual distances between bodies stay unchanged. Yeah. So for this, we have to look to, to try to find solutions that are um, invariant rotations right? to the rotation. So we have to look for all the possible rotations uh, which you encounter. And actually, I will show you. Uh, immediately some solutions, since, since you asked me uh, the question about, I will show you immediately some solutions that where the center of mass is moving with the bodies. Yeah, and it's not, it's not, of course, you have solutions also, but in general that means you don't have integrals of the center of mass. No? So the center of mass is going and is moving nicely with the solution and you cannot fix it anywhere. No? So, but now we are looking for orbits that where the mutual distances between them stay fixed. So on the sphere, these are this is these are all the isometry groups. That's what the isometry group looks like. Now these are in, in uh, R4. So we're in R4. So we have two types of rotations. You see, rotations in R3 we have just one rotation. So in R3, I would have here just the matrix would stop here and here the whole one instead. Yeah, but here I have uh, another rotation. So I can fix, for instance, theta. Let's take it zero, then I have one, one, zeros everywhere else and this. Or I can fix here, it's the same thing. Then I have that rotation, one, one here, and zeros everywhere else. So these are, it's the uh, Lie group SO3, if you want to call it differently. So then uh, I will show you that uh, when just one rotation takes place and the other is fixed, we got some solutions which I call elliptic. And when we have double rotations, so we have two rotations in R4, we got 
solutions which I called elliptic elliptical and also neo solutions. Now, if we go to uh, H3, things are a bit more complicated. This is called the Lorentz group. So we have more rotations. On one hand, we have rotations when I keep this constant. I call it elliptic, but there will be negative elliptic because I'm in space of negative curvature. I will have new solutions. If I keep those constant and let those move, then I get so-called hyperbolic solutions. Negative hyperbolic, I call them. And I let both move, both angles. Then I get double rotations, which are both elliptic and hyperbolic. Now, there is another other types of element in those groups, the so-called parabolic rotations, but I will show, I can show that they lead to no solutions. No uh, relative equilibrium. So those I can ignore from the beginning. And one, the reason why they don't is because you can, they always um, violate the angular momentum conservation. So they cannot lead to solutions, the parabolic ones. But all the others do. And now we can write what they should look like, these solutions, using those uh, elements of the groups. So what I call positive elliptic, when you have just one, one, one rotation, so they look like this. Positive elliptic elliptic, so this is on the screen. Right? This is in S3. Positive elliptic elliptic, they would look like this. You have two rotations, and then the negative, so in H3, we'd have negative elliptic, which look as you see there. Negative hyperbolic, again, you have just a hyperbolic rotation and not a, an, an elliptic one. And then both combined, elliptic hyperbolic, where both rotations take place. So these are the, the solutions have to look like this in order to be relative equal. So what do you do now? Well, you can make educated guesses, what kind of solutions you look for, and then you check. Or you develop criteria, that's what I did first, actually. But it's boring to write down the criteria, they're long, they're, but that make your computation simpler. So with all these criteria, then, I could find solutions, and my, more than that, I could prove some results that tell me qualitatively how the solutions will be. But before I get to results, let me notice another type of solution, which actually is simpler than the relative equilibria, but uh, they occur only on C, on the C, not on the hyperbolic C. Maybe um, fixed points. It's something we don't have in Euclidean space. Now, because for a simple fixed point, think of the equal masses and put them on the equator at the vertices of an equilateral triangle. With zero initial velocities. They will move. Yeah? Because forces compensate each other. So they will, you put them there, they stay there. But if you give a rotation now along the equator, give them a rotation, whatever frequency you want the rotation to have, you get the relative equilibrium. Yeah? Move them fast, they will move fast. Move them slowly, they will move slowly. Stay all the time at the vertices of the equilateral time. So, it's important to try to find fixed points in order to find some type of relative equilibrium, because they're not all, but a subclass of relative equilibrium. Yeah? So, for instance, the equilateral triangle, as I said, on the great circle, the surf, the, the great circle of a great sphere. What do I mean, great circle of a great sphere? But in S3, if I cut, think of R4, in R4, I cut S, uh, S3 with an R3 space that goes to the center of the sphere. Then I get to get a great sphere. That's what it's called, a great sphere. And then when I cut this with a plane I, uh, that goes to the center of the sphere, then I get the great circle. Uh, I don't have to take equivalent triangles. I can take any triangle that is uh, uh, has no obtuse angle, so it has to be uh, that kind of triangle, so it cannot be just in, in a hemisphere, it has to be uh, all over the sphere. 
and I can find masses such that I have a fixed point. So that's another possibility. Yeah. The regular tetrahedron with equal masses is also such a body, but now such, such a fixed point. But now let's look for one that is not on a two sphere, well, because all these three examples, uh, these three examples are on two spheres. Now I want an example that is not on a, is in S three, but is not on a two sphere. And here is an example: three collateral triangles, each on complementary great circles. What do I mean by complementary great circles? This is what I mean. This circle and this circle are complementary. Now in the sense that here I have two zero components and then two zero components. So if I go back, if I take three bodies equal on an equilateral triangle, another three equal on an equilateral triangle on another circle that is complementary, they will form a fixed point, and here is the the um, the coordinates of those. So if I take those, put them in the equations, I can see that I have a fixed point. No, they get checked. Okay. So now let me do just three or four slides of crash course in uh, geometric topology. So as I said, two circles are called, I call them, well, that's, I call them complementary. When I talk to geometry, say, well, we don't have a name for that. We call them, uh, we call them, uh, they, they are hoplings in a hop approach. That's what they told me. What does it mean? Um, a hop flink in a hop, a hop vibration, uh, so is, you have to take this function, h a hop function, from S3 to S2, which takes um, points of S3 to points, in, so takes, uh, yeah, in, in S3, circles of S3 to points of S2, and using the stereographic projection, um, Hopf could show that these are linked, are linked like the Olympic circles. Yeah. Moreover, we can cover the whole sphere with such, uh, such, uh, such circles. Now, for us, what is interesting? For us, what is interesting is that the distance between two such circles is constant. Well, it's nothing you can imagine. It's, hard, it's impossible actually to imagine something like that. If you want, the only analog would be take the equator and take, take the north pole or the south pole. Now, the North Pole is a circle that is a trivial circle, right? It's one of that circles is collapsed to a point. Because from that point, from the North Pole, the distance to any point of the equator is the same. Now, that's the only thing you can see. But I can see through a computation, right? Because the distance is the arc cosine of the product, the distance of the sphere. So then for such two circles, because there are two components zero here and two components zero here, do the dot product that is zero. So then the distance between those circles is 2 pi. <coughs> is, pi is pi over 2, I'm sorry. It's pi over 2. Yeah. Well, this is extraordinary for us. Because it means that no matter where a point is on one circle and the other one on the other circle, the force attracting them will be the same. Not the direction. But the value of the force will be the same. Okay. Now, a remarkable family of surfaces in R4 is that of Clifford torus. What's a Clifford torus? Well, it's a torus like ours, like the donut, you know, just that it in, lives in R4, not in R3. Well, this is a big difference. Why? Because now in R3, Three to make a torus, what do you do? You take a square, right? you identify two points, you get a cylinder. When you identify the two points and get a cylinder, you don't have to stretch the sheet of paper, do nothing. So metric is still the same. I didn't change the metric. Right? But now from the cylinder to make a torus, I have to stretch the exterior and to squeeze the interior. 
in R3, right? So then I'm changing the metric. Actually, on the normal doors, now I have, it's not constant, it's not constant curvature anymore. Now I have points where I have positive curvature on the side, and inside I have negative curvature, and I have points where curvature is zero. But if I'm R4, when I do this identification, I have a new demand, not as an extra dimension. So I don't have to stretch or squeeze anything. So the difference between the perfect torus and the normal torus is that the perfect torus is flat. It's exactly as flat as the cylinder or as the, as the plane. But the perfect torus lives in S3. As a surface which lies in S3. And this is very important. Actually, you can foliate S3 with Clifford Tor. That's the beautiful part. So you foliate it, so you know, uh, all the points get covered by some Clifford Tor as well. It's very hard to imagine something like that, but this is what happens. Here, if you see, it's a 3D projection of a 4D foliation of S3 in the Clifford Tor. Whatever you can try to represent something. And what is interesting is that if you take a Clifford torus, then it divides the sphere into two solid Clifford tori, of which it is the boundary. The given Clifford torus is the boundary. Now, so the sphere is, is split, it's called a um, <coughs> um, has a name, but now I, I forget. It. How it's called doesn't matter. That's it. But it's a split. And now with these tools, I have a theorem that tells me how relative equilibria behave qualitatively on the sphere C. And then I'll have a theorem also for uh, in what happens in H3. But let's look at this one first. Let's take n volumes, at least two. Then we know the following, what can happen. Then the corresponding solution, if it is a relative equilibrium, um, will say it's, it's, you have just one rotation, not two rotations, so it's a, the, what I call positive elliptic. Uh, then each body is moving on some circle, which doesn't have necessarily to be a great circle. But if we restrict ourselves from R4, you know, because in parallelism of two lines doesn't make sense in space. It makes sense only in the plane. Right? In the plane, the two lines are parallel or not, because in space you cannot talk parallel. These two lines are not parallel. No, but they don't intersect either. So, you have to, so the same thing for circles, you have to talk in, you have to be in some R3. So this is the R3 spaces. I'm talking about, and I can say that those circles are parallel with the, uh, the plane WX in either of these spaces. And the bodies have to rotate on these circles. And uh, another possibility is that, you see, some bodies rotate on a great circle of a great sphere, while the other bodies stay fixed on a complementary great circle of another great so you can have this situation, three bodies, do, for instance, see, I'll show you an example of this happening. Three bodies stay, and other three move. Now, which is very strange, you know, because you cannot have anything like that. You, you cannot put some bodies to stay in space in, in Euclidean space. It's impossible, you'll start moving towards each other, right? the attraction, but in, on the sphere you can have that situation. For this, at this point, I'm not only proving results, assuming that some solutions exist. I haven't proved, I haven't shown any solution yet. I'm telling that if they exist, they will have to behave this way or this way. No? And no other way. Here is a, with a double rotation, so you have both rotations, uh, so it's an elliptic elliptic, with some body rotating on a great circle of a great sphere, the other body is rotating on a complementary great circle of another great sphere. And another possibility is that each body is moving on a Clifford torus. 
That's all we can do. Now, let's see, do we have such solutions? Sure. So here is one of the syllabus, the Lagrangian solution. No? Bodies at the vertices of the equilateral triangle. But, as I showed somewhere else, uh, they can exist unlike in flat space where the bodies can have any mass. Here they need to have equal masses, so I don't have the solutions. Otherwise the solution doesn't exist. So here it is. Okay. Actually, Regina Martinez and Carla Simo showed that you have some zones for the solution, some zones of linear stability, which is quite quite strange. So if you have the sphere, let me draw this for you. If you have the sphere, then you have a zone here in the equator, and then you have a zone here where you have linear stability for the blood pressure solution. Everywhere else it's unstable. Okay. Now, here is a four-body problem solution. Now, what happens, in effect, we're still not okay with the, with the projection, because it doesn't show my titles. You know, I was wondering where they are. Uh, you said, you know, I have titles for each slide and they don't show. <laughs> so, you know? <laughs> So I don't know why. Oh, they do. Yeah. Now they do. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It was not, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. I was, it was my fault. Okay, so here is an example of relative equilibrium as in, as in case two. So place four bodies at the vertices of a regular tetrahedron. Yeah. And um, what happens is that M1 and M2 move, move on the Clifford torus with R equals zero and O equal one, which is a circle. So very particular kind of Clifford torus. And the other bodies move on the Clifford torus with those radii, R and O equal like this. And sure, here are uh, what the, the coordinates of the first and second body look like, and here are those of the third and fourth body computed there. So the tetrahedron rotates uh, nicely in, uh, on the sphere. Okay. Now, a theorem that tells us what happens just if I take fixed points and rotate them afterwards. So that those relative equilibria that they obtain from fixed point configurations. Yeah? For instance, can be a simply rotating positive elliptic relative group for which all the bodies rotate on the same great circle of the great sphere. That's one possibility. Another. Simply rotating, so one rotation for which some bodies rotate on a great circle of a sphere, while the other bodies are fixed on a complementary great circle of a different great sphere. Of course, these are embedded in the other theorem, but these are just for these type of solutions, for this subclass of solutions. Yeah? Then three, it is a doubly rotating, so like positive elliptic elliptic, for which some bodies rotate with frequency alpha on a great circle of a great sphere, while the other bodies rotate with frequency beta. And alpha and beta are in the middle of each other. So you see this is a type of solution that is not even periodic, it's not quasi-periodic. Yeah. Which you don't find anything like that in Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, relative equilibrium are always periodic. And four, it is a doubly rotating positive elliptic relative equilibrium with frequencies alpha and beta equal in size. That's another possibility that we can have. Okay. Examples. So here is from that fixed point I told you that it doesn't lie in any two sphere. I do the rotation, well, one I rotate, the other, what circle I rotate, the other I keep fixed. Yeah? So it's an equilateral triangle that stays fixed, and the other rotates on the complementary sphere. A complementary circle. Now that's what the solution looks like. Equal masses. So an orbit of this type, in general, is quasi-periodic. And as you see, two rotations. Relative to this plane, Wx, relative to plane Yz, and no rotations relative to the other planes. Now, this theorem is about quadratic behavior in H3. And I have similar things. So 
Here I don't have a subclass. It's just a single theorem. Negative elliptic with a body of mass mi moving on a circle of hyperbolic two spheres. So hyperbolic two, two spheres is think of the upper sheet of the hyperboloid. Again, the hyperplanes in those hyperplanes, those circles are parallel with the plane of the vertex. Another possibility, simply rotating negative hyperbolic with body, body of M, mass mi moving on some hyperbola, not necessarily a geodesic hyperbola, of a hyperbolic two sphere. Again, the hyperplanes must be parallel with. Uh, YZ, and now to have two rotations. And those don't live on Clifford Torah, don't have Clifford Torah in, in uh, uh, a hyperbolic sphere, but I can foliate it with so, something, uh, a geometric object I call the hyperbolic cylinder. Because it looks like a cylinder, I mean, the distance, so it looks like if you take this, the axis of this from the axis, and this hyperbolic distance is the same. And it looks like this. This is the formula that gives you the hyperbolic set. But it's, of course, it's one side and the other. So I can have on this two rotations. One rotation along it, along the cylinder, because the cylinder looks like this, and one like this, it can rotate this way. Okay? And I'll show you immediately solutions of this type as well, of each type, actually. So here is uh, one that has just a hyperbolic rotation. Think of it, because this is actually a two uh, hyperbolic spheres so on, the, on the hyperbole. It looks like this. Think of three bodies, one, two, three. Think of a hyperbola, a hyperbola that goes to the vertex. So you take a plane through the x, to the z-axis, keep the plane. You can face the z-axis, so you have this hyperbola. So one, two, three, body moves on this hyperbola. And then two other move on hyperbolas that you obtain by taking two parallel planes to the other plane. Yeah? And move on. So they move all at the same time, like this, all three of them. Yeah? All three of them move like this. Like airplanes in formation. This is a, a case of solution I mentioned before, where the center of mass is not fixed at The center of mass moves <coughs> nicely with the um, with the uh, with the box. Yeah. We don't even talk about the quasi quasi-periodicity here. We don't have anything. I like airplanes information. Just under the influence of gravitation. You cannot imagine anything like that in our space, in Euclidean space. At least we think it's Euclidean space. And finally, here is one that does a rotation as well. So you have so uh, not the other rotation. So they rotate along the hyperbola, but also at the same time have a screwing motion uh, at the same time. So this is a solution of this time along the hyperbolic center. Okay. So such that you can get a taste of how exotic how exotic this, these equations are, what kind of orbits. And those are you know starting from very simple assumption, namely that only you have relative equilibrium. Now you can talk about the generalization of the homograph orbits. I'm not going to talk about them, but I have a paper, I wrote a student of my paper, about over 50 pages in the end, where we find I what I call rotopulsators. So instead, you don't have just, you have, they, they change shape. They change size. Shape doesn't change, but size changes. Now, so they are like rotate and pulsate at the same time. That's why I call them rotopulsators. But that's a different story, and it gets more complicated there. However, what I wanted to show you, finally, is the extension I obtained to the equations of Newton, in which the case kappa equals zero gives you the Newtonian equations. So this is what the equations look like. The trick is to use, instead of using the Geodesic distance, I never showed this to anyone yet. Well, I put it in the archive and submitted the paper for publication, but this is my first talk where I showed it to people. Because I just got these results recently. The idea is to use 
the Euclidean distance. Of course, it doesn't change anything. The motion take, continues to take place on the sphere. And once you fix the Euclidean distance and fix the curvature, you know what the geodesic distance is. So it's just the way you express the equations. Yeah? So you see here we have the, the equation, the, the Euclidean distance in R4. Here is the Euclidean distance in R3. And here is the, the Minkowski distance, which is not even a distance in the sense of no, because you don't have uh, uh, the triangle inequality is not satisfied. But who cares? It doesn't matter. It works. Things work and it's used in this distance. If you want me to write it on components, to see better, this is what the equations look like on components. Yeah. You see, if I take kappa equals zero, this Rij is the Euclidean distance between two points, right? So if I take kappa equals zero, we are left with zj minus zi. This becomes zero. This becomes zero. Everywhere. So I'm getting for kappa. Well, of course, I, I need to put the constraints, but only for the initial conditions. They are here, the constraints, which, in case I take, take kappa equals zero, I get zero equals zero. Yeah? So they vanish. Or if you want, this is what I get when I take up equals zero. If you want, they don't vanish in the sense that this quantity vanishes. So I can think of R3 as a hyperplane in R4. So then I have omega and omega dot equals zero. So I still have two n constraints. Yeah? And these are the equations. So these are the nice generalization. And from now on, you can start and look at bifurcations. To see, to study the n-body problem, the n-body problem can now be studied from this point of view and to see how such solutions bifurcate when you go to kappa equals zero. This is something you couldn't do with previous equations. Previous equations you could simply study the kappa different from zero case. Everything. Tell everything you want about it. I have equations in uh, intrinsic coordinates too, so after obtaining them after I know what they look like, I, I, but they're very complicated. Still, you can do work with that and use a differential choice. The interesting is that you, you, you have now a way of going through kappa equals zero. And the first thing you do, of course, is to look at the integrals of motion. And if you do the computations, this is what you see. Integral of energy is there, there no modification, nothing changes. It's the same in flat case, it's the same in non-flat case. <coughs> Center of mass. You do the computations, you see that you have three integrals in kappa equals zero, and zero integrals for kappa equals zero. Bifurcation, integrals of the linear momentum. Again, same thing, three integrals for this kappa equals zero, zero for kappa different from zero, and integrals of the total linear momentum, three for kappa equals zero, and six for kappa different from zero. So everything comes nice and clean now of the equations. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. These new equations, sure. I mean, they, they, it's already a very interesting point because so far I couldn't do that. No, I couldn't. I could look just at the case kappa different from zero and then try to see what happens in the limit. But now you can study, for instance, stability. No? Take a solution, if you have a solution, say the Lagrange, right? and you look how stability changes when you change the parameter. Or you can try to see, to find orbits that are in kappa different from zero and see if they live in kappa equals zero as well, or the other way around, you know. Uh, because obviously things may change. In some cases they are the same, in other cases they are not. You know? Because we have already had the integrals of motion and have bifurcations. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, it opens a new world, a new world of research here. So there is room now for different, for generations to study these new questions. Yeah, I, I used, I had an idea when we went to, I mean, you couldn't come to Lumini, but that's, I had an idea how to do it. I did some computations and then I let them gestate in my mind until I finished my teaching uh, this spring and then I uh, managed to it. <coughs> the coordinates there are, I, the trick was not to keep the coordinate system at the center of the sphere, but to move it at the North Pole. Because if you move it at the North Pole, then that's where you know, the sphere becomes flat. There, and then from the flat sphere, we get hyperbola. So they are all tangent at that single point at the North Pole. So you move this coordinate. The problem <coughs> is that you know, if you keep the center here, the radius becomes infinite when you when, when cut by zero. So that was the problem. So you move that there, and then uh, it's not. You have, it's not enough to do that. You have also to change the distances. Because none of the other equations I have, not the intrinsic ones, not, none of them, all of them become undetermined at kappa equals zero. Now at kappa equals zero, everything falls in place. Yeah, social. There is room for some. I'm, I'm quite excited about this. I haven't been able to write these equations. But so far I haven't used them. But I'm sure that people will start using them. Because they are quite comfortable, much more comfortable than the other questions. So my question is very crazy, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, you, perhaps you know that in galactic dynamics, a way to make that, that matter disappear is uh, requires to correct the uh, gravitational potential. It, it's a way. Okay. And do you know if somebody tried to uh, say, to, to explain uh, these corrections of the gravitational potential in the same way as the universe were not flat, was not flat, but on, on something different. So it could be maybe a way to introduce a, a, a curvature of the space and to study some, something like that. I don't know. I, no. I, I don't think it is. No, it's not so. The it only is thing so that, meaningful. But. The, the only thing that was done so far uh, for the constant curvature case is this. For the non-constant curvature case, as well as the papers I mentioned by uh, uh, Levichita first, he has actually a, written a book as well about that. First, the paper, it's a paper in, uh, I think, 39 or something like that in the uh, uh, Journal of the American Mathematical Society. No, American Journal of Mathematics, American Journal of Mathematics, London, it's published uh, Optum of the University Press. Um, then immediately Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman had their uh, discretization of Einstein's equations uh, in the Atlas of Mathematics, 40 or 41. And then Vladimir Fogg in the early 50s, the Russian physicist, did something similar, but each obtained something else. These things then developed into what is today called the post-Newtonian approximations, which are very useful. For instance, without them, we wouldn't have the GPS. For very practical, for practical reasons, it's very useful. But they are very hard. I mean, you cannot do anything analytically there. Right? You put the equations on two pages. You know, it's very hard. So. Uh, that's all that was done so far. Uh, uh, nobody looked at that, at least I'm not aware of. Because physicists don't do that since they believe that space is in, strongly believe that it's flat. 
So well, the heavy elements shows that it is almost flat. Yeah, almost, but almost. Well, yes, almost yes. within the position <coughs> of uh, several digits. So yeah. this is double map or? Well, well but on, so on, on which scale of distance? This is also a question. Yeah, sure, sure. For planetary motion, okay. Of but, course. For planetary motion. But apparently in the in galactic dynamics there is something missing. Yeah. So well, I, I don't believe that this is a way. But what what you're saying is it connected to most of the theory? No, 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 you say to to the dark matter. Mm -hmm. I mean or you, you prescribe there is an abundance of dark matter that cannot be seen and so on and so forth, but it, it influences uh, the gravitation. Or uh, that there is a theory that try to, uh, tries to connect, uh, to correct the, the gravitational potential. Bond, M-O-N-D. Okay. Yes, this is a modified Newton. Uh... Okay, and, and then maybe, can be interpreted the like curvature. curvature. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in people in jet propulsion and NASA, they use all kinds of, they don't use the Newtonian equations they are for their computations of uh, spaceships and so on. They have much more complicated equations, already, but all kinds of perturbations, you know, relative to solar wind, many, many things, and many terms there, but don't mm -hmm. do, just for, to compute, you know, the motion of the planets, and, and just that, and they have uh, much more complicated equation than what Chuck Laskar is using, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but only in America, of course, they don't do anything direct. They are interested only in what happens uh, you know, and they, even those equations are not good enough because they have to redo them every six months. After six months, the plans move differently than the equations say. So it's part of all these corrections. So <laughs> how do you take them up? There is a rigorous proof of planetary mobility. It's done by, uh, I can give you the reference uh, right away, I have it on my uh, here. Uh, it's done by a Russian guy. No? Shepet, Shepet, or something like that. But you've seen Zippy method, huh? If I remember No, 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 no. No, he uses some complex, uh, complex function approach. Yeah, it's not using the uh, Okay, more questions? So if not, uh, let us thank the speaker again. So I can give you the reference uh, to say thank you. Yeah, and to give you back this too. I don't <laughs> <to forget. laughs>